Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Ebersole, the Executive Director of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. And I'm really pleased to have with us today Allison Bentley from CIMIT, and, who, and she is the Global Director of Wheat at CIMIT, and will be giving us a, a, a talk about what we eat and the, the major thing that we eat, which happens to be wheat. But before we start on that, I'll give you a quick overview of the uh, IWGSC and uh, before we go into the webinar. So we are an international consortium. We have uh, more than 3,300 members in 71 countries, and we work with a lot of institutes and uh, also have eight sponsors. And these sponsors, I want to thank them for their support for the IWGSC as it makes it possible for us to actually have things like this webinar series, as well as our workshops and other activities. So our vision after we got the first reference sequence in place was to really enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. And there are a number of activities that we are uh, doing and in trying to achieve that. We are working with IWGS, uh, with an IWGSC Arbor Biosciences collaboration to try to increase uh, tools for uh, our community, as well as we are also working with a couple of other companies, and you'll be seeing some things coming out in the next uh, year or so. This year, we saw the release of IWGSC RefSec version 2.1 and a new completely redone annotation version uh, 2.1. We're also in the process and hope to have in time in January of next year, a clear process of how you as scientists can contribute to the manual and functional annotation of the reference sequences. We're also starting an IWGSC diversity project, which is based on having the, the eight land races sequenced at really high quality that represent the breadth of wheat diversity. So it would be really a complement to what CIMIT has, to what the Watkins collection has in, in uh, the UK, as well as what is available in many of the other gene banks around the world. So it would be a, a strong complement to that. And then, of course, we continue to encourage people to provide early release of genome sequences for elite varieties, as well as other genomic resources. And we try to make a platform for them to do that. So just to let you know, our next webinar will be uh, based it will be uh, on the interaction between wheat cis and trans factors and shaping regulatory networks, and it will be on the 28th of October, and I would encourage everyone to register for that. And before we actually start, I just want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the IWGSC YouTube channel in a few days. You can subscribe to the channel so that you'll get every upload and see every presentation, even if you can't make it for the live presentation. We will have an opportunity for, for question and answers, so please submit your questions in the Q&A panel. You, you can also monitor the chat uh, to see messages from organizers, as well as we might send you links to different things. Already, you can click the handout button and download the both my presentation, which is pretty brief, as well as Allison's presentation. So I would encourage you to do that. So let me turn it over now to Allison Bentley. As I mentioned, she's the director of the CIMIT Global Wheat Program, and she's going to talk about wheat to eat, accelerating plant breeding to address global food and nutrition security. Allison. Thank you very much for being here today, and we look forward to your presentation. Many thanks, Kelly, for, for that introduction. And thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present at the webinar series uh, today. I, I'm really happy to, to have the opportunity to share a little bit uh, about what the CIMIT Global Wheat Program does and, and our objectives of addressing global food and nutrition security through research for development. Uh, and in my talk today, I'm going to talk about some of the, the methods and approaches we're using to accelerate the plant breeding process, uh, and also about some of the recent work we've been doing on cereals for nutrition and health. 
So, so just to start and set the context for this presentation and for the work that we do here at CIMIT. So we recognize that, that the global wheat area is, is huge, feeding a population of 2.5 billion people. Uh, and it's really important in the context of this presentation to, to recognize that over half of the world's wheat is produced in developing countries. So we hear really a lot about innovations uh, coming through the pipelines and the private sector engagement, but really within CIMIT, our mandate is to serve this half of the world's population of wheat area, which is grown in the developing world. Uh, and we have really a lot of interesting and important contrasts, uh, and just one highlighted here that really we're working with smallholder farmers uh, who are producing typically on, on very small areas of land uh, and productivity and uh, resilience are both really uh, important criteria in, in terms of the delivery uh, of wheat for food security. So to, to get into the content of, of the talk, really what we see today is a vast array of available breeding tools and resources. And this has really accelerated hugely uh, in the last few years. Uh, and this runs all the way from our genetic resources, as Kelly mentioned, really important efforts to sequence these genetic resources and understand uh, what functional variation that they, they hold, the use of that, that variation, uh, integration into elite germplasm, our ability to, to assess material in multiple environments and to use those environments to inform our selection. The, the really big explosion in phenotyping methods and remote sensing these amazing technologies which offer a huge amount of potential uh, for use in breeding. Uh, and then moving into the lab, we have marker assisted selection, which is now relatively well established. Uh, and then moving that forward into, into pan genomes and the use of biotechnology and genomic selection and other genomic based technologies. Uh, and then in the context of this talk, we also have our quality parameters. So our, our our knowledge of the end use specifications that, that are required uh, and also the developing technologies uh, in terms of the quality traits that we are able to select for uh, and improve as part of the breeding and selection process. Uh, and really this, this vast array of tools presents us with this challenge of how do we funnel these into breeding improvements. Uh, and in the CIMIT context, how do we make sure these are equitably deployed uh, to, to reach farmers and smallholder farmers in the developing world? So we see that we really have this challenge now is, is not so much in the, the technology being available and ready to use, but is in how we actually think about deploying it uh, and, and really capturing it all in the seed that we have to provide as our base material into the production system. Uh, and this is one of the challenges that we're, we're thinking a lot about. What of these technologies uh, should we be using? Should we be allocating resources to? Uh, and how can we best uh, derive uh, a product from, from the outputs of, of these amazing technological uh, advances? Uh, and just for a little bit of context in terms of the CIMIT program, uh, there's a long history of impact worldwide through the provision of improved germplasm. Uh, and this shown here on the right hand side is a, is a graphic which, which just shows um, from a relatively recent study uh, the impact of CG ancestry uh, wheat germplasm uh, in our target environments in, in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. So we know that CG material has huge penetrance either as parents or as direct products uh, into these key production environments. Uh, and this comes from a centralized breeding program based here in Mexico, uh, where we use the shuttle breeding uh, scheme, which was established by, by Norman Borlaug, to allow repeated cycles of intense selection throughout the breeding generations. Uh, here in El Batan for, for our Russ, uh, and also in Toluca, where we have high disease pressure, uh, and then into the high yielding environments in northwestern Mexico, uh, in Ciudad Obregón, where we can select for uh, yield potential in optimal environments, uh, as well as for some of the, the stress tolerances, uh, and also the addition of the Enduro platform run uh, in partnership between Calro and Simit in Kenya uh, allows for the screening of all of the breeding material for resistance to stem rust, uh, a very important uh, global disease threat. 
So, so these impacts come from a germplasm base, which is developed to encompass diversity, wide adaptation, and a strong portfolio of disease resistances uh, to multiple pathogens as the first line of defense for farmers in the developing world. Uh, and this has, has achieved these, these levels of penetrance into these target environments over the past 50 or so years. Uh, and we can also quantify the breeding progress as well as looking at the parentage of varieties grown uh, throughout different parts of the world. And we can quantify the, the breeding progress that has been made over time through, through um, selection experiments, through through side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, and on the left here, you see uh, the performance of material developed in the CIMIC Global Wheat Program from 1970 to 2010. Uh, and here in both our optimal environments, which is shown uh, in the top green line, uh, and in the stressed environments shown in, in the bottom two lines, you can see this continuous uh, increase in genetic progress uh, from the breeding effort over time. Uh, and then this recent study from Leo Crespo, one of the pipeline breeders here at CIMIT, also shows uh, a similar trend in our, in our actual target environments. Uh, in this case, in India, where we can see the grain yields uh, of the elite material produced for optimum environments in the centralized breeding program in CIMIT, uh, increasing over time at the similar rate of genetic progress. So we're able to, to document the, the impact of CIMIT germplasm into breeding programs as parents or as direct release products, uh, and also to, to generate this data to quantify the rates of progress uh, in yields over time. Uh, and really the next step is, is asking, can we further accelerate that breeding progress and, and thinking about ways in which we can apply new tools and technologies uh, for rapid generation uh, advancement to reduce the breeding cycle time. Uh, and so really this is targeted uh, at this stage, at the earliest stages of the breeding program uh, and a large investment in greenhouse facilities to, to try and really speed up the earliest stages of the breeding process. Uh, and this aims to reduce the cycle time significantly from about six years at, at present using the, the shuttle breeding scheme uh, to three years um, for these early, this early stage of the, of the breeding process. Uh, and this obviously will have a significant impact, we hypothesize, on genetic gain because we can move material through the pipeline uh, much more quickly. We're also using uh, genomic selection as a, as a method, both for advancing promising uh, material through the program, but also for, for faster recycling of parents. So the material can go back into, back into the breeding program at an earlier stage, uh, and again, be used uh, as a way to speed up the breeding process. Uh, and then here on the right, you can hopefully see the speed breeding chambers, which have now been established by Suchis Mido Mondal uh, in Toluca. Uh, and these are for novel trait introgression, so using speed breeding to rapidly introgress um, specific uh, genes or QTLs. Uh, in the case, in, in this case, mostly focused on uh, disease resistances, which we want to get into our elite parents as quickly as possible. And I'll talk a little bit more about the progress uh, with adoption of these rapid generation methods. Uh, and the reason we do this, obviously, is the hypothesis that this will increase our genetic gain. And this is just a, a view of the simulations that have been, been run by the biometrics team uh, here at CIMIT. Uh, and in the blue and green lines, uh, we see the genetic, the expectation of increase in genetic gain from these rapid schemes versus our current breeding scheme, which is shown in red. We can also observe, as to be expected, that by applying these very aggressive accelerated schemes, we also reduce our, our variance over time. As to be expected, we're converting this variance into uh, genetic progress. Uh, but this also keeps in mind the need to have a continual pipeline of diversity coming through uh, with an accompanying pre-breeding pipeline. Uh, and that, those objectives I won't cover today, but that's a, a very important pillar of this work. So we hypothesize that these, uh, based on the simulation data, based on the, the quantitative genetic theory, that driving the breeding programs faster in the earlier stages of breeding will really accelerate the rates of genetic gain, genetic progress for the yield traits that we can achieve over time. 
Uh, and this just gives you a view of the facility. Uh, so the first cycle of our crossing is now complete. So about 1500 crosses. Uh, this is an area of about two hectares. Uh, so, so a very significant uh, area, which is which is undercover uh, in an effort to, to accelerate both the, the these early stages of the breeding program, uh, and we can make uh, significant numbers of crosses uh, and progress them uh, very rapidly. Uh, and this is Suchas Mera Mondal, who is the the wheat breeder in the team, who is leading the optimization of this facility, which is really important uh, for testing and achieving this objective of rapid progress in the early breeding generations. So alongside that, as I mentioned, we're using a speed breeding facility, also newly established, um, to really drive the marker-assisted trait development pipelines. Uh, and these are used for several purposes. Uh, and in the context of the breeding programs, uh, for two specifically, so for augmenting existing lines with additional characteristics where we have a marker trait association uh, and we need to be able to deploy that in a, in a finished variety, uh, but also importantly in the development of parents, elite parents, which carry uh, specific uh, variants or traits of interest, uh, as well as the, the role of discovery. Obviously, discovery remains uh, very important to the program in terms of feeding that pipeline of new variation, uh, new trait variation and new trait associations that, that are required uh, by the, the target markets and geographies uh, we, sh we serve. And so I wanted to, to share a little bit about our thinking at the moment uh, about how to really optimize these, these trait pipelines. Uh, and we know from the literature as well as many, uh, many projects at CIMIT and a lot of work that there's been a huge effort into to really detecting genes or QTLs for specific traits of interest. Uh, and, and really the challenge now is to triage these QTLs and, and work out really where do they fit in terms of a, a very very large scale breeding program and, and how do we really deploy them in a sensible in a sensible way. So you can see, if, for example, if we have a large effects QTL that's been discovered uh, through a research research and development program through, through the literature, uh, we can deploy this uh, by a marker assisted back crossing or forward breeding using our speed breeding trait pipeline. Uh, and this provides us with new parental material, but also the ability to augment an existing variety for a specific characteristic. Where we have a large effect, um, QTL unknown, we can also incorporate trait variation for pre-breeding uh, using the established uh, phenotypic assisted or genomic assisted pre-breeding pipelines in the wheat physiology team here at, here at CIMIT. Uh, and this is hugely important in terms of creating validated pre-breeding germplasm, which can enter the population improvement stages of the breeding program. Then we also have work on gene discovery, where it's really uh, core target genes or QTLs, which can help us to select progeny uh, and individuals in segregating generations. Uh, and then we also have the option of genomic selection, which is now becoming more and more embedded within the program, both for the advancement of material in, early, in the early stages of yield testing, uh, as well as the rapid recycling of parents. So, so really the challenge for, for the program at the moment it is triaging these, these, this knowledge that's being generated at a, a hugely rapid pace uh, and trying to put it into the right place to, to really serve the breeding pipeline uh, and to drive forward the breeding progress. Uh, and this just gives a summary of the current lion augmentation that's that's progressing through the speed breeding uh, facility in Toluca uh, for both the bread wheat and the durum wheat programs. As I mentioned before, most of this is focused on disease resistances where we have relatively uh, good information about the sources of variation uh, and there are markers uh, available. And, and I'll just talk briefly about two of these examples. So one for intergressing uh, green bug or aphid resistance, uh, and the other for novel variation from wild relatives for heat and drought tolerance. Uh, and this really builds on, on many people's work uh, to identify these QTLs or, or genes. Uh, and really the, the idea is to, to get them as quickly as possible into elite backgrounds to, to provide uh, input into these product profiles, which are, are really how we're defining uh, our breeding objectives uh, going forward. 
And this is obviously supported uh, and very important component of this trait pipeline uh, is the ability to genotype uh, and provide data rapidly uh, to breeders um, to use for this selection process. Uh, and this is just a, a summary of the data workflow in the Wheat Molecular Biology Lab, which is led by Susan Dreisegacker, uh, which shows really the, the scale. Well, I guess it doesn't show the scale, but shows the, the steps in the process. And, and this is really uh, important for, for us, as well as all other breeding programs, is really to have this, this workflow that, that fits within these very tight uh, time windows. So we're obviously accelerating the breeding cycle. Uh, and by doing that, we also need to, to speed up the workflows for the, the enabling technologies, uh, and in this case, uh, genotyping, uh, and really trying to use um, service provision or, or and data storage options that, that allow for this process to, to go as quickly as possible. So as I mentioned, we're uh, focusing largely on pests and disease resistances. Uh, and this is an example of the current work on trait introgression for insect resistance, uh, in this case for, for green bug aphid resistance, uh, and with the objective of pyramiding four loci into a single background that can then be used as an elite parent uh, to serve the product profiles where we require this trait, so where our target uh, market and end users require uh, a high level of or an increased level of aphid resistance. Uh, so this resistance has been identified by Leo Crespo, one of the pipeline breeders, uh, also an entomologist uh, in synthetic wheat material. Uh, and the work that Leo has been doing has allowed identification of, of QTL and development of breeding markers in collaboration with Susanna Dreisegacker. Uh, and now the challenge uh, using the speed breeding facility is rapidly pyramiding all of the known sources of uh, resistance to, to aphids. Uh, and this is the, the scheme. So we're, we're attempting to pyramid these four loci uh, in a, into a single background with the hypothesis that the pyramiding of these loci will give us uh, a high level of resistance uh, to aphids. And then that parental material will be available to, to serve the breeding pipelines where we uh, have a requirement for, for aphid resistance. Uh, and then in addition, not all of the traits that we're focusing on are, are disease resistance. And this is uh, an example of some novel genomic regions which have been identified uh, in populations which were derived from uh, linked top crosses with exotic parents, so synth synthetic hexaploid wheat uh, and land races uh, crossed to elite parents uh, and used for, for um, trait dissection uh, and genetic analysis. Uh, and this work's being led by Deep Muller Segal in the program. Uh, so the, the analysis that Deep Muller uh, conducted on this material, uh, these linked top cross populations, which represent an elite by a diverse um, cross uh, in, a linked, in a linked fashion, uh, produced a large number of pre-breeding lines. So you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the genetic diversity space that exists in these, these populations. Uh, but it also allowed for the, the haplotype mapping of the exotic contribution. So what was the contribution um, that was, was coming through these linked top cross populations that, that arose from these wild relatives, so from the land races and the synthetic uh, hexaploid parents. Uh, and this is interesting because we really want to, to track the exotic genomic regions with the hypothesis that these will bring with them uh, novel variants uh, and, and novel uh, functional variants which can be exploited uh, in breeding because it, it doesn't already exist uh, within the pool. Uh, and you can see uh, here on the, the top left, uh, marks with green stars, where Deep Muller has uh, identified exotic specific associations. So this is where we detect uh, the contribution of one of those land race or synthetic parents. Uh, and here the hypothesis is that they, these offer a novel functional variation. Uh, and that can be exploited in, in breeding. Uh, and looking at the validation of, of this, which is shown on the right-hand side, um, on the haplotype basis, we can see that, that some of these uh, associations do offer um, increased performance for, for key, key characteristics of interest in terms of the SIMIT uh, breeding program, in this case, heat stress. Uh, and we can also see the haplotype, parent, the, the haplotype frequencies that exist um, between these exotic parents uh, and the gene bank. And so really look at, at which of these 
uh, a potentially novel haplotypes that, that really haven't yet been captured uh, in the wheat gene pool. Uh, and this is interesting to us because we obviously want to introduce novel variation uh, for, for criteria for our biotic stresses as well as for abiotic uh, stresses, uh, which are becoming increasingly prevalent in, in the target geographies that the CIMIT program uh, serves. So in this case, uh, as in the aphid example, what we're trying to do is to, to bring together multiple a low side, uh, in this case, the exotic specific associations that Deep Mahler has identified in her analysis, uh, and to say, can we actually move these, I, I guess, less well, slightly less well defined than when we compare it to a, a specific disease resistance? Um, can we combine these uh, using the speed breeding approach uh, and derive lines that are improved for these exotic specific uh, genomic uh, segments uh, and then use those uh, as parents in the breeding program to obviously bring through very uh, in a very clean manner uh, the diversity that exists in these wild progenitor species uh, and land race accessions. So this just shows you uh, two different examples of how we're using this, this trait pipeline uh, to really try and speed up access for the breeding programs to novel variation that's been discovered through uh, various research and discovery projects uh, and really get them into an elite background as quickly as possible uh, and into the hands of the breeding uh, program. Uh, and as part of this work, Deep Mull has also been cataloging the QTLs uh, which have been previously described by the CIMIT program as well as by others. Uh, and you can see at this stage where we have a relatively small number of, of traits being incorporated through our trait pipeline, uh, but the, the ambition is that we can really start to move uh, a lot more of these QTLs as we have the reference genome data, the pan-genome data, more site of the haplotype variation that exists, that we can really try and accelerate the translation of these QTLs into actual uh, parents and material that can, can flow into the breeding programs. Uh, and as I mentioned, going from the QTLs to the haplotypes, uh, this is work that we're very interested in progressing for, for all of these different QTLs that have been identified for specific traits of interest to our breeding pipelines uh, and working with Christopher Wowie's group at the John Innes Center as part of the new CIMIT John Innes Center strategic collaboration. Uh, we're really looking at how do we, how do we take this haplotype uh, information and, and make it readily available as a selection tool uh, within the breeding program. Uh, and just to, to finish this section, uh, we're we are also obviously big users of, of genotyping data. And I previously described uh, Susanna's pipeline for the, the diagnostic marker side of things. But increasingly, we recognize the need for, for really kind of mid-density, low-cost uh, services, which can be used for not only by the CIMIT program, but also by national programs in, in different parts of the world uh, with different levels of resource limitation um, to, to genotype characterized material and also to apply genomic selection very rapidly within programs. Uh, and so Susanna has been uh, working with the Excellence in Breeding program within the CGIAR uh, to develop these DART tag um, mid-density, low-cost genotyping uh, platform. Uh, and at the moment, uh, this is in phase two, uh, and you can see this is a, this is a panel of about 4,000 SNPs, uh, which is um, the, the previous iteration had, had about uh, 2,500 SNPs on it. So really, this is the, the limit of where we are. We want something around the 4,000 SNP mark uh, because of the cost per data point. Uh, and, but really, Susanna's been looking at how we enrich this to include QTL and gene-related sequences and to ensure um, we're really developing an array or a, a, a genotyping option that is both informative and predictive uh, that also links to other efforts uh, in different parts of the world to, to develop further, further uh, mid-density type uh, genotyping offers. So we have connectivities with the KSU exome sequence capture platform, uh, as well as to ongoing developments in the UK with the development of, of breeders arrays, which have been very effective uh, at describing the variation. So, re so really, uh, the idea here is that we create a product which is, is low cost uh, and allows for accurate use of genomic selection 
uh, across both the CIMIT and national uh, breeding program so we can really bring together these data sources uh, and use the power of this information uh, to, dr to drive uh, greater breeding uh, gains over time. So now I wanted to, to come to, to talk a bit about nutrition. I think maybe you may have noticed in, in the previous slides really the focus on, on yield and productivity uh, and that's obviously a, a big objective given that all of the challenges which are very well described about the growing uh, population, climate change uh, and the need for increased productivity uh, in agriculture. But increasingly we're aware, particularly in the geographies we serve, where wheat forms a large part a large part of the daily diet, uh, that nutrition is a very important component of the offer of, of wheat. Uh, and, and a lot of this work has been uh, led by the socioeconomics program uh, here at CIMIT. Uh, so Olaf Ehrenstein and, and Jason Donovan, who are part of the, the socioeconomics program, along with Nigel Paul uh, from SOAS in the UK, uh, and really thinking about um, the contribution of, of maize and wheat to human nutrition and health. Uh, and obviously eating a full food basket of, of diverse and, and healthy foods is, is the optimal outcome. But I think in many of the geographies uh, where wheat is, is a core part of, of human nutrition, uh, we're still quite a distance away from that ambition of, of healthy and uh, balanced diets. So, so really asking the question, what can cereal, what can we do more within the cereals, the staple cereals, uh, to not only be a, a source of calories, but also to be a source of uh, important nutritional elements. Uh, and this is from this recent paper, which is has been published a few, few weeks ago, continuing cereals research. Uh, and this just shows that nutrition isn't necessarily just about how we think about nutrition as biologists, biologists and, and breeders, uh, but that obviously is an important component. But th there are many facets of nutrition uh, and really our, our portfolio needs to include the, the socioeconomics components, the processes, the manufacturers, uh, all the way through to the distribution uh, and the drivers of, of balanced diets, because balanced diets are not only driven by supply, uh, but also the creation of demand and the understanding of uh, of demand drivers. So, so we're, we're really at the top of this um, point with what we're doing in the breeding program, uh, but trying to think much more about how this fits into the landscape of, of this whole food uh, system uh, in order to really deliver something that is, that is gonna have an impact uh, in the longer term. So if we, if we look at our breeding objectives, uh, one of the core objectives of the, the CIMIT Global Wheat Program has been the decision to mainstream micronutrient biofortification, uh, specifically focused on zinc, uh, which is um, a, a key micro element, which is typically uh, deficient uh, in many diets in the developing world. Uh, and so this um, ambition to mainstream micronutrient biofortification in, in wheat grain uh, aims to address hidden hunger and the, the um, impacts of malnutrition uh, in many of the geographies that, that the CIMIT program uh, serves. Uh, and this work is, is led by Avelu Govindan, who's the, the zinc uh, breeder based here in, in Mexico, uh, and has really been looking at can we increase the levels of grain zinc without compromising yield. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with the negative trade-off between yield and quality uh, components, uh, and obviously reducing yield uh, is not is not a feasible option in terms of delivering this this uh, this ambition of increasing micronutrient uh, levels within grain. So Velu has been working uh, to to really look at can we increase the levels of, of grain grain yield at the same time as increasing uh, grain zinc. Uh, and you can see here on the right hand side this is this shows um, the the recent analysis of the past 10 years of the zinc pipeline. So this is a co-selection for yield and grain zinc. Uh, and we can see that the levels of, of yield gain are, are near 1%, 109 kilos per hectare per year increase in yield, uh, whilst also having this minimum increased level of grain zinc. So this ambition to, to really drive both yield and zinc uh, using quantitative based selection uh, has been effective at, at increasing both the yield uh, and the levels of, of grain zinc. 
And, and as I said, that was in the, the, the zinc specific breeding pipeline. Uh, but with a mainstreaming objective, really, this is a selection me metric we now need to apply within all of our breeding pipelines. Uh, and if we look across all of the, the breeding material, we can also see we have a, a significant level of variation uh, for grain zinc. Uh, grain iron is, is associated with, with zinc, uh, which is also shown here. So, so we know we have material in our core breeding pipelines, which it performs higher than our, than our current checks or control varieties. Uh, and this is really now the next objective is as well as having a zinc specific pipeline is saying, can we can we push for the yield, the co-selection of yield and zinc along with the full package of agronomic traits and disease resistances, uh, which are the baseline for the program uh, in order to to mainstream this, this zinc target within within the, all of the programs. Uh, and zinc uh, and other nutritional traits don't just stop. Uh, with the grain being biofortified, uh, and so a lot of work is ongoing to also understand um, how the bread production process, uh, particularly for different types of products uh, which are produced from wheat grain, we know there's a diverse end use uh, portfolio that comes from harvested wheat grain, uh, but to really understand how is how the micronutrients retained within biofortified wheat, because if we provide a biofortified grain, uh, a plant that can produce a biofortified grain products, we want that to be translated uh, into the food production system and value chain. Uh, and so this um, work is led by Itria Eber, who, who runs the cereal chemistry uh, lab here at CIMIT. Uh, and Itria and her, her team have been looking at the, uh, the impacts of grain and flour processing on zinc, con zinc concentration. Uh, and what you can see here is that there is um, an effect of the extraction rate, which is used on the flour. Uh, and this is the major determinant of the zinc concentration that is then uh, measured in the, in the flour bread uh, and chapati, which is made from this, uh, this flour. So this gives us uh, an indication of really the optimal extraction rates that we need to work with in order not to lose uh, the zinc component. Um, and interestingly, uh, and, and uh, a good result that the bread or chapati product production does not negatively affect uh, the zinc concentration. And obviously there are many other products and, and many other methods um, for, for making bread, making chapatis, making other wheat-based products. Uh, and so ideally we'll expand this study to, to really uh, look at the impacts of the different uh, end use production uh, criteria on zinc concentration. Uh, and then uh, in an ideal world, expand that to the community where you have home-based preparation uh, of different products uh, and understand really what the impact is of that zinc concentration uh, through the processing uh, of wheat flour into products. And in addition, we know that, that biofortification uh, and micronutrient provision is not, only, not the only thing uh, that wheat can give. Uh, and wheat grain fiber is, is increasingly uh, of interest in terms of uh, dietary fiber provision, which is becoming more and more uh, recognized as a necessity within healthy human diets. Uh, and Itria and her group have also been looking at this characteristic in terms of arabinoxylin uh, content, so the, the fiber um, components. Uh, and what they've been aiming to do is identify germplasm with increased grain fiber content, as well as to develop the tools to allow us to select for higher fiber within the breeding program. Uh, and many of the, the markets that we serve are reliant uh, on whole grain processing. Uh, so we see this as an opportunity to, to increase some of the healthy outcomes um, in, in addition to the provision of, of nutrition and, and calories. Uh, also work to understand the environmental effects on grain fiber content and the effects uh, on overall wheat um, quality. Uh, and really, as I said, the, the ambition here is to, to provide this additional benefit of, of healthy dietary fiber uh, as part of the package that can be provided uh, to increase uh, human health. Uh, and so Itria's group has been analyzing these arabinoxylin components uh, and, and produced a, a GWAS to identify uh, some of the underlying uh, genetic controllers. Uh, and this enabled the production of, of a new marker, which is able to distinguish uh, the higher and the lower arabinoxylin uh, lines uh, and the use 
conversion of this into a breeder breeder friendly marker for application uh, in the breeding program. So this is now another selection candidate which can be can be incorporated uh, into the, the package of traits that can be provided uh, by the program. As I said, many of the, the markets that, that we serve are reliant on wholemeal bread products uh, and a, a lot of um, increasing interest in the, in the role, role of whole grains and, and wholemeal uh, around in different parts of the world. Uh, and I think one of the questions is, uh, we know that, that whole grain wheats are, are eaten and are, are processed, but can we actually make whole grain wheat healthier in terms of the bread making potential? Uh, so this just shows some results of some uh, relatively recent experiments to, to look at the different ways uh, using all the bread making procedures and quality characterization um, to, to compare the, the quality of, of bread products made with classic methods, so refined, refined flour uh, and, and salt, uh, low sodium breads where we, we're not adding salt to the refined flour, uh, as well as wholemeal flour uh, with the addition of salt. Uh, and we can see that the, the, the refined flour plus salt, which is probably the, the product many of us eat, uh, gives us as expected uh, the highest uh, quality parameters on, on basically all of the assessed, um, assessed scales. Uh, and, and as may be expected by many of you, the wholemeal, the wholemeal uh, product it has a lower quality, but also a lower uh, taste and desirability uh, character. Uh, but when you look further into the data and, and the comparisons, uh, what we can see is that we can actually identify uh, wholemeal lines or low sodium lines, which are performing at a relatively high level of uh, quality. Uh, and this gives us a, the clue that we may be able to actually improve the current selection uh, for optimal uh, production of wholemeal or low sodium, uh, low sodium bread. So, so this gives us this opportunity to, to produce healthier, healthy bread uh, that, that, um, that combines these, these different characteristics. So just to, to come back to my introductory slide, uh, I think there are, I haven't covered all of these, um, these various areas, although the CIMIC program is working uh, in all of these, these aspects, but really these breeding tools, resources, all of the developments that are occurring within the community uh, are, show a tremendous rate of progress and potential for application in breeding programs uh, to reach the hands of farmers in the form of improved varieties and seeds. Uh, and the challenge that, that we face and, and that really um, directs our focus is how do we equitably deploy these breeding tools and resources uh, to get them into improved varieties that are preferred by farmers uh, and that provide stable and resilient uh, varieties uh, and seeds and incomes for smallholder farming communities. So I'll end there and I'm very happy to, to take any questions. Also, if you'd like to find out more about the CIMIC Global Wheat Program, uh, our donors and our partners, please do get in touch. You can also read more here on the, the websites for both the, the CIMIT Wheat Program as well as the CGIR Research Program uh, on wheat. Uh, and much of the work that I've presented today is part of the Accelerated Genetic Gains uh, in Wheat Project, which is supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, USAID, and the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research. Uh, and with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Fascinating talk, Alison. Thank you very much. It's, it's really great to see the breadth of the CIMIT program. It's been a critical component throughout uh, the history of, of wheat breeding over the, the past half century, for sure. And I um, really appreciate the, the very thorough explanation of the program. We do have a lot of questions that are starting to come in, as you can well imagine. And just to remind everyone, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A panel. We will try to get to as many of them as possible, but uh, if we don't get to your question, then it will be answered in writing subsequently. So one of the uh, first questions, and this will go back a little bit to uh, the nutrition issues. Are you measuring uh, cadmium content in the high zinc germplasm? And if so, have you observed any correlation between the content of the two elements? 
So the, the short answer is in the in within the breeding material, no, because of the time and, and cost of, of doing that. But in smaller subsets of material, yes. Uh, in addition to phytic acid, which is obviously a, a big component of understanding putative bioavailability. I think really for, for in the context of our program where we have 9,000, 10,000 lines in stage one yield testing, what we need is, is really rapid, rapid methods that are, that are quick in terms of the turnaround of two to three weeks to make a selection decision, uh, but that can also be deployed at, at low cost because we've got all the disease and, and other characteristics that, that also be, need, to be, need to be costed. Um, so, so yeah, very relevant to, to have the cadmium uh, aspect, also very relevant to consider, consider really the bioavailability and, and the ability to test um, that in, in a lot of detail. Um, but within the context of a live breeding process where decisions need to be made in, in two to three weeks, um, it, it is very difficult to, to, um, to use those really comprehensive tools. So, so really interested in, in high throughput technologies that can be used that are predictive, um, but also from a more research perspective, um, looking at all of those micronutrients and the interactions between them. I think there's a lot of work which shows all the trade-offs and, and interactions between the micronutrients. And there's a huge amount of potential uh, to understand more, to understand the trade-offs and, and how we could optimize uh, selection. But short answer is no, but, but definitely of, of, of great interest, um, specifically to, to really understand the interactions and, and how we can select for the optimal, the optimal combination of interacting factors. Thank you. So the next question, to, uh, the next question is that also about uh, nutrition. Have, have there been significant advances in the development of iron biofortified by bread wheat? So iron is much more difficult uh, because of the bioavailability uh, question and the, the phytase uh, relationship. Um, and, and I think there, there is a lot of work ongoing on, on increasing the levels of, of grain iron. Um, and and getting it out of the alurone and, and into the actual um, starchy endosperm where you're not consuming uh, whole grain products. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of really interesting routes uh, in development, John Inner Center and others on, on gene editing for, for iron transport creation of, of GM or gene edited products, which, which have novel novel pathways for the plant to accumulate and send iron into the grain. I think that there will be a lot of exciting results in that space, which show really that you can, because it's a, it's a transport, a lot of this is transport and then location of, of the iron. I think that we do, it's, it's an example of where we need to understand the, the biology of, of how the grain is really accumulating the, the iron. Uh, and just having a quantitative breeding objective of continually selecting for, for iron without understanding the biological trade-offs or the, you know, the biological mechanisms which allow iron to enter, enter the grain uh, is not going to achieve as much. So, so I think I, I'm really excited to see the results of, of some of that GM and, and gene editing work not necessarily in, in the form of releasing a product, but in terms of really understanding the biology of how, how iron can possibly get into the grain and then you know, using that to, to inform the, the biology of the breeding strategy to, to increase iron. So I think that's, that's from my perspective where we are with the, the iron work, lots of opportunity uh, to develop. Yeah. You know, this week they released in, or got approval in the United States for a gene edited maize line that increases phytase. You know, so that's a kind of an excellent example of uh, potential uh, opportunities in this space. Um, does CIMIT work on hybrid breeding? And if you do, can you talk a little bit about the approach and your goals? Sure. So CIMIT has had various. Uh, efforts on, on hybrid breeding. At the moment, we don't have any current projects uh, really focusing on, on production of hybrids. I think as everyone um, I'm sure is aware, there's a great opportunity in hybrids and, and also a, a great opportunity to really look at how they can be deployed in the developing world for, for resilience, marginal environments, 
uh, and increasing productivity, as well as addressing uh, disease constraints. So the, the approach previously has, was working with industrial partners where we had access to germplasm, CMS uh, material to create hybrids and, and test them. Uh, and that work, uh, some of which is, has been published, it has shown very good performance of those, those hybrids uh, in target environments in South Asia. So I think that the question is not, can you make hybrids with good levels of yield? I think the question still, for, as for many people, is how you produce the seed and how you do it at scale and what the value return mechanisms are. But a lot of interest in, in the program, and obviously we, we have a very wide diversity base, uh, which offers a lot of potential really for, for thinking about hybrids and, 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 and we also have a very effective um, dissemination, um, you know, reduction to practice. Uh, and I think we're, we're really keen to, to continue to, to work on hybrids, um, but obviously in partnership with, with the owners or the providers of the technology, because that's, that's a, a key component of delivering successful, successful hybrids. You mentioned partnerships, <clears throat> and you, you talked a little bit about this during your presentation. Um, with regards to the partnerships with national uh, research programs, how, how, are you, how are you actually doing that to preserve or to strengthen what is being done in country, for example, or to help build the, um, you know, the longevity of some of these programs than, and lack of, and eliminate some of the continued reliance on CIMIT, for example? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and, and I didn't cover it today because it's but it is a, a an important component of the accelerating genetic gains uh, program. So part of this program is about the early stages of the breeding program. How do we make them as fast as possible? How do we get as many beneficial traits and as much potential into that material? And, and then the second part is is how do we work with the national programs to provide that material that's fit for their purpose? and to do it earlier in the breeding stage. So rather than sending 50, uh, 50 fixed, finished, finished product, potential products, can we send, send that material much earlier to be used as diverse germplasm in national breeding programs? And then what support is needed to, to really make sure that that material that we provide is, is targeted to the breeding objectives uh, in those in those locations. So within the AGG project, we're working with partners in South Asia and East Africa with that specific objective to say, okay, how would we scale up really the, the, the breeding programs that exist there uh, and provide material that really serves the specific breeding priorities of, of those environments. And I think that also flows back to the trait pipelines. Again, having a, a, you know, we have a centralized way to really quickly accumulate QTLs from the literature or from previous studies or incorporate novel disease resistances. But how do we generate, how do we determine the demand for those? And, and I think really looking at how we have a, a much more structured way of, of assessing, okay, in Bangladesh, really there's a priority for salinity tolerance. So how do we really quickly from the literature using this centralized trait introgression pipeline create parents and, and populations that have enhanced salinity if that's a, a core breeding program target uh, of the Bangladesh program. So, so that is a really uh, important component of the program and, and scaling up the testing which occurs in those target environments. Because then you, you essentially, I guess I, I like it because you let the environment do the work for you. So you, you let the environment be the, be the selector um, much earlier in the process and, and really the proposal there is that allows you to get much more specificity out of the material really optimized to that production environment. Do you see an increased uh, need perhaps for what they call participatory breeding? Yeah, I think there's been some really excellent work recently by Jakob Van Etten and, and others at the Alliance Biodiversity and SEAT on participatory variety selection. So this is saying actually you don't need to get all variety candidates tested in replicate and on all sites. What you can do is send out different sets to different uh, on-farm locations potentially. Uh, and then use the ranking of that and, and use kind of data-driven methods um, to bring that data together and, and, and let the data decide what's progressing or let farmers 
you know, really use the farmer decision making as the means of varietal selection. So I think there's there's a huge amount of, of interesting uh, work to be done in that space. I think in the case of wheat, we have a, a great opportunity as well, because typically on station yields are highly correlated with with on farm yields. Uh, obviously, there's a differential, um, but really looking at can we shift some of this um, variety assessment or pre variety assessment or post variety assessment onto farms. Uh, and again, let the farm do the work in terms of determining the preference and the performance in that environment. And I think it's particularly relevant for the, the abiotic stresses where we have really a range of, you know, you use the production environment uh, if you can capture a range of, of different um, features, really use that to, to kind of build the resilience in the selection by, by doing it from the environmental perspective rather than from the the purely breeding focused um, perspective. All right, well, let's get back to a kind of a more technical question. Do you apply early prediction of parents to cross for a potential superior performing off offspring? Yes, yeah, so the, the GABVs are currently used to, to predict as part of the selection of parents. So they're not used exclusively for the, the selection of, of parents going into each of the breeding pipelines. Uh, but so at the at the moment, oh, it's, it, over the last few years, all of the stage one, so the first stage yield yield trial material has been genotyped with GBS uh, and used uh, as a prediction to make predictions, uh, and then from that advanced material, but also uh, make the selections uh, for the parents to be recycled back into the, into the breeding program. So it's it's not used exclusively, but it's one of the sources of information that the breeders have to select the parents, which go into each of the specific uh, targeted uh, breeding pipelines. So talking about your pipelines, can you uh... Discuss in a little more detail the product profile development process. Yeah, this is a really uh, interesting and relatively new new component of the program. So, so the SIMIT programs traditionally run a very large uh, central pipeline, uh, which incorporates uh, the objectives of, of capturing maximum diversity and wide adaptation because the material goes to 90, 100 partners around the world. So the material has to be really widely adapted. Uh, and, and I think at the moment we're, we're really transitioning to, to a product profile uh, driven, pipeline driven uh, approach. Uh, and so here we have defined pipelines which are targeting uh, irrigated and non-irrigated environments. So obviously the, two, the major differentiator of the environments uh, we serve. Uh, and then within that, really breaking it down to by maturity group uh, and by the, the stress profile. So whether it's a heat stress environment or a drought stress environment. Uh, so, you, so you have, it's kind of like a, a flow chart, essentially you have irrigated or non-irrigated and then within your irrigated, you have normal maturity, early maturity, heat stress, drought stress. Uh, and then within that, you have the necessity for the, the disease package that you know is, is the feature of that specific production environment. So it's really that process of, of really breaking down all of the, the requirements of the environment that, that the material is going into, uh, and then using that to, to build the picture of, of what the, the plant actually looks like. And, and that's the product profile that you produce. So it needs to have early maturity, it needs to have septoria resistance, it needs to have white grain, uh, and that's really how you how you come upon that. Uh, on paper, it sounds very, very uh, simple and you can put it all in a matrix, but in, in practice, we, we know that, that much of the material is, much biological material is not defined in, in such tight specifications. And, and we know that the environment's changing as well and the pest and pathogen portfolio is changing and the end use requirements are not you know, if you're serving uh, a region of northern India, the end use requirement is not a single end use requirement. That wheat's going to be used to do a lot more things. So I think it, it's trying to structure it, but keep some flexibility and diversity uh, there to ensure we really meet uh, the demands of, of our end users. Now, I recognize that everything you've talked about has something to do with yield, but we do have a question. And of course, um, I know you're not going to be surprised at this. What do you think is the best way 
to overcome the yield plateau for wheat? Well, I guess I can be controversial and say it's maybe not all breeding based. And I think that's a that's a really core cool rep core recognition, right, that, that genetics is part of the picture. I think our, the on-farm management is, is a huge component of, of the, yield, the yield gap, and I think there's a lot of literature to, to really show that the, the yield gap is not only genetic, it, it is a huge amount of it is about leveling up in terms of, of crop management. I also think we're working within the CG on the, the cereal seed systems. Uh, and I think the the mechanisms of of driving varietal adoption and turnover, uh, there is huge opportunity there as well to to look at at how, especially in our context in in the developing world, a lot of informal seed seed sector, a lot of um, low low rates of new variety adoption. That it isn't just all genetic, right? If variety new varieties are not adopted, then you can put whatever genetics or whatever exciting science you want into a seed. But if the seed isn't turning over, then addressing the yield penalty from the perspective of genetics and what can I do as a breeder is not really going to be hugely uh, effective. You know, it's part of a continuum. And I think really a lot of, um, a lot of interest in, in addressing that continuum and, and also linking the agronomy you know, the varietal specific agronomy, we can do a lot there. I, mean, I know Kelly, you work on the, the phytobiomes, you know, there's, there's a huge kind of gap in our understanding of why specific genetics performs in specific environments and for what reasons and how we can use that to, to better design those systems. So, so yeah, controversial to say it's not all genetics and, and breeding, um, but I, but I do think a, a much more integrated approach is really needed that goes all the way from what we put in the seed to how do we get the seed into the field to how do we manage the seed, uh, and then how do we kind of recognize the the value of that continuum. And I think you also you know mentioned the importance of the smallholders and you know by bringing in when you look at that try to look at that systems approach, there is this tendency to focus precision agriculture on the large farms and. The reality is we do need, particularly in wheat, given that half of it is being produced by smallholders, to focus on the small farms and trying to do that. And you know that could increase the opportunity for what we call participatory breeding or actually participatory research, in fact. So yeah, huge opportunity and small mechanization, I think, is you know, there is a there is a developing community there and a lot of exciting exciting things to come and, and how you integrate that with financing models and access to seed and and join that up as well because yeah i mean they're, they're not big farmers but if you can harness the the improvements that can be made across a, a really large number that then you can really drive it in with a different mindset to just everything has to be based on a big farm right to be effective you can you can drive it in a different way well, I could sit here and ask you a lot of other questions, and there are a lot of other questions on here, and just enjoy speaking with you about the really fascinating work that is ongoing at CIMIT. And thank you again for taking your time today, Allison, to be with us, and we really look forward to working with you in, in the future and to see the great results that will be coming out of CIMIT under your leadership. So. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, webinar. Have a good Thanks day. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye.